Uh, let's begin tonight, first before we do anything, in prayer like we do all things. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit down upon us here tonight. You thanks for this opportunity to come together. To come together in your name. To explore our deeper calls to holiness. We give you thanks for this opportunity. We ask that you to open our minds and our hearts. I ask that you to touch, to touch my words, to speak through me, that we would take home, take back that which you wish us to receive. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, as we also pray from Holy Scripture, we read, A highway will be there called the Holy Way. No one unclean may pass over it, but it will be for his people. No traveler, not even fool, shall go astray on it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening. So, we good down here? All right. Got all that squared away? Tonight, we are here to talk about our call to holiness. <laughs> we're going to talk about holiness. Uh, we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to talk about what that looks like, the call to be holy in general. Uh, all these things. And so the big question we really need to ask ourselves first is, what is holiness? What is holiness? I'm asking. Raise your hand. Tell me. What is holiness? Set apart. Set apart. Okay. What is holiness? Yes. Accepting the will of God, will of God is holiness. Any? Yes. And doing it is holiness. Living a moral life, Living a moral life is holiness. Anybody else? No, that's it. That's all holiness is, right? You can all go home. <laughs> so, accepting the will of God, doing the will of God, being set apart, these are all wrong answers. That is not what holiness is. That is not what holiness is. Holiness is a... I can, actually, you know what? Before I continue, when you say being set apart, yes. you want to elaborate? What does that mean to be set apart? You could be right. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, just different than everybody else. The whole mix of everything going on. Right here around us, different than the ra around us. No, I mean not here, but different okay. than the people in the world around us. Yeah. Okay, you're wrong. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure before I said you were wrong. So holiness, holiness is a state in which we are constantly striving to attain. So. All these answers that you've given, holiness is being different, holiness is answering God's call, holiness is, is A, B, C. As somebody uh, the other night told me that holiness was being closer to God. Also a good answer, also a wrong answer. How many of you feel that tonight you are closer to God or that you've answered His call in some way in your life previously or even now? Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> okay, you all feel you're closer to God right now. You all feel at some point you've answered God's call. Who here thinks you are a holy person? Go out of here. What's wrong with you? <laughs> she doesn't really think that. Uh, or maybe she does. <laughs> we don't think we shouldn't. Excuse me? I haven't given you the definition yet. No, 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 hold on. Holiness is <laughs> striving to attain, but never reaching. It's, but you can't reach it. Hold on, let me finish. Let, listen to everything first. <laughs> We're getting there. This is the journey. Holiness is the destination. Okay? So holiness is a state that we are striving to attain, but cannot reach here in this world. All right? That state of holiness is unattainable. You cannot get there. You cannot do it. At least not on your own. Not yet. We are on this journey. It's the difference between holiness versus the, the path to holiness. So, for example, these are from Scripture. Uh, Thessalonians. <clears throat> First Thessalonians or excuse me, uh, Revelations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. 
1 Samuel, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. No one is holy but God. So there's nothing you can do, there's no action you can take to make you holy here. These are all things, everything we've named, everything we've talked about so far, these are all things we do on this journey to holiness, the path to holiness. No one is holy but the Lord, right? But we're all called to holiness. So First Peter, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You will be holy, not yet, but you will be because I am holy, God. First Thessalonians, for God has not called us for impurity, but called us in holiness. So none of us are holy, only God is holy, and yet at the same time, God is calling every one of us to holiness. So how do we attain that? How can we attain that which is unattainable? Well, it's unity with God. We strive for peace, Hebrews, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It's this, this idea that holiness is the attainment, the completion of that journey. So attaining holiness means ultimately walking this path, walking this faith journey. So what does the end of that path look like? What is the, the road? If we're all on this journey to holiness, it's something we can't attain. What is holiness then? What's at the end of this road? Does anybody know? Who went to... Oh, see, I want to say you're right, but, and you're technically right, but it's, it's, so, it's more nuanced than that because it's... it's who is say it again being with god. so yes being with god but not just being with god because we can all say we're with god here right god is amongst us so it has to be more than that who was at my last talk on the incarnation who can who from the incarnation who can tell me what this picture is do you remember this picture this icon what is this an image of do you remember no I mean, yes, that is Mary, but that's not what's being conveyed here. Uh, so the, there's the mandala, yeah, but that's not what we're focusing on today. But that is in there. This is an image of the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is an icon of the last book, the last passage in Revelation. This is the end. Remember I told you, I've told you in the past how Scripture is booked in with marriage. right? You have the marriage of Adam and Eve in the beginning. You have the wedding feast of the Lamb in the end. This is our image, our calling to holiness. This is our unity with God. So heaven, being one with God, is not technically wrong, but it's much more nuanced than that. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's this final destiny of being finally one with God. And this comes at the end of time. Not just, not just heaven, but when heaven and earth pass away and we are finally one in that beatific vision with God. Okay? This is holiness. Because the only way, if God is the only one who is holy, then the only way to attain that call to holiness, to fulfill it, is to be one with he who is holy. This is our final calling. This is our unity of God. This reality is made manifest in certain ways here in this world. Okay? So we can look at certain things and see that, okay, this reality, this calling to holiness, this is, this is something that can happen. God has given us certain signs, certain images, certain things, where he says, hey, here's the path, here's the road, here's how you answer this call, here's how you get from where you are to this place right here. And he does that through the sacraments of marriage and priesthood. This is the divine image of the visible image of priesthood and marriage. So that we say that the sacraments are... Uh, visible signs of an invisible reality. Priesthood and marriage are the visible signs of this eternal reality. They mirror this. We go, Turn that off. What are you doing? <laughs> they mirror this. These are our first callings to holiness. But they are not the last. Because I know right now, everyone's head, you're thinking, is Sister Susan here tonight? No? Okay. So, Sister Susan, for example consecrated life. She is neither married nor a priest. And so you have people who are single. You have consecrated virgins. You have uh, religious orders that, that aren't ordained priests, monks, friars, nuns, things of that nature. So while this, this is the first, 
this first call to holiness is by far the last. Because this, this idea, so how does this translate? What does this look like today? Everyone is called to holiness. Every single person, regardless of your walk in life. And every call to holiness, in one way or another, points to this image right here. Now, we're going to focus mainly on priesthood and marriage, and then next week we'll do, um, uh, well, next, tonight will be priesthood, next week will be marriage, and then at the end of next week we'll talk a little bit about consecrated life and, uh, and single life as well. But to understand these sacramental calls, you have to understand the basis for which they're, they're rooted in. So this, this understanding that priesthood, that marriage, are these primary calls to holiness, right? To this, this, that they're the symbol, this visible symbol of this divine sign. To understand that, we have to understand the foundation that they're built on. To understand the calling, so priesthood and marriage become, they become pillars that hold up all other calls to holiness, whatever that walk of life looks like. And those pillars aren't just sitting there, right? They're on a foundation. And that foundation, which is the foundation for all holiness, regardless, is... Ooh. My heart skipped a beat there. If that fell. (laughs) That foundation, that call, is Christ and his bride, the church. Also, I'd like to point out that never in my life have I made a PowerPoint presentation. This is the first one I've ever done. So be easy on it. I wasn't looking for that, but just, <laughs> just be, yeah, anyway. Uh, Christ and his bride, the church. Uh, this is the foundation of all holiness, okay? It is the foundational relationship in which all other holiness, all other calls to holiness are built upon. So like I said, priesthood, marriage, they become the pillars that rest on this relationship right here between Christ and his church. So what is this relationship? What does Christ and his church look like? Essentially, we start with this. The church is created when? It's created at the the cross, at Calvary. The church is created from the blood and water that pours from the side of Jesus. This moment, that moment at Calvary, gives birth to the bride. This gives birth to Christ's bride. The bridegroom, from him, from his side, is birthed the church. Now, in that moment, and in every moment forward, what happens? The church then it becomes incomplete without her bride, Christ. Without the church, if Christ had not died, then what would happen? His mission would have been incomplete. He would have been brideless. There would be no church. What would have been the point if he hadn't given himself fully to the church? If the church, if the church had, was incomplete without him, if he had never been, and there was the church, what would be the point of church, the bride, if it wasn't for Jesus? They're incomplete without each other. Christ's mission becomes incomplete without the church. The church becomes incomplete without Jesus. They need each other. They sustain each other. This relationship is a total gift of self from one to the other. It's a complete, unconditional receiving of that that gift from one and from the other. And so Christ gives himself totally and fully, even in death, to the church. The church gives herself fully to her bride, the church, or the church, her bride, Christ, the bridegroom, Christ, excuse me. As we go forward, the terms priest, groom, bridegroom, I'm going to use interchangeably. Church, bride, interchangeable, okay? <laughs> It'll be clear which one I'm meaning, though, as, we, as you see the images, though. This relationship between Christ and church mirrors another relationship. So if you have the pillars of marriage and priesthood, and the foundation of that being Christ and his bride, the church, what is the ultimate call to holiness? Unity with God, right? Why? Because God is only holy. The only holy one is God himself. So this relationship here, okay, becomes an image, a mirror, this relationship between Christ and the church, his bride, becomes a mirror image of the Trinity. The relationship of the Trinity. So now, with the Trinity, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, God the Father, loves the Son unconditionally, fully, completely, 
gives himself fully to the Son. The Son receives that gift and gives himself fully to the Father. It's a complete selfless act of love of giving and receiving from one and the other. And from that divine love, you have the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want you to dwell too hard on that analogy. With any analogy with God, it will always, always break down eventually. No analogy is perfect for he who is perfect. Okay? So, if you dwell on that too hard, that concept I just told you, you're going to quickly find yourself in an area of heresy. Okay? <laughs> And what I mean by that, when you start to think, oh, well, the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father, and oh, here comes the Holy Spirit. That implies, that analogy, just leave it, leave it on the surface level, okay? Because this is also part of the mystery of the Trinity, because what I'm about to say makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, okay? The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, here's the Holy Spirit from that love. And yet at the same time, we equally say that the Holy Spirit has no beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal, they always were, they always are, and they always will be. So if you dwell too much on that, that, uh, that analogy, that imperfect analogy, as all are with God, then you quickly start to think, oh, well, it sounds like the Holy Spirit has a beginning. And it, he doesn't. There is no beginning. Okay? It's the closest approximation we can get to to understanding something that is ununderstandable. This talk is not about the Trinity. We could go on and on about that. I just didn't want you, to, at the end of this, to be like, did the Holy Spirit have a beginning then? You know, just to clear that up right now. This becomes the image and goal of all relationships, okay? All relationships, whether it's between me and you, whether it's a husband and wife, it's uh, children, siblings, friends, whatever. This is the goal of all relationships. This is the goal of all calls to holiness, Right? This gift of self. So Christ and his bride, before we go, let's understand his bride a little bit, the church. <clears throat> we don't have to understand Christ too much. We all know who Jesus is. I don't have to go too deep into to his role in this. Right? He is the, the bridegroom. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the spotless victim, all these things. We know Jesus. Okay? What about his church? What about his bride? We don't talk as much about her. So the first question is, what is the role of the church? What is this relationship that she has with Jesus? So in this relationship, what is her role? Well, first and foremost, she's there to be adored. She is there to be adored and to be lifted up by Christ. That's her role. The bride's role, the church, her role is to be elevated. Adored by Christ himself. Who is, what is the church, his bride? People. You. Yeah. You are church. In one sense, you are church. Now there's a deeper spiritual sense that goes beyond the people. So as an individual, you're not church. But as a people... You certainly are. You certainly, certainly are. You are the bride of Christ, his holy church. You are, he, you are the one who he lifts up, who he elevates, who he adores. When you praise him, when you adore him, does he not reciprocate that? What did I just say? Where was that? When you, church, <laughs> are giving yourself fully to God, to Christ, does Christ not give himself fully to you? It's this same, this back and forth, this complete gift of self between the two. You are the church, you are Christ's bride. But it's also something more. So in addition to the church's role as being the object of Christ's adoring love, her role as bride goes even further. Because she becomes the protector and the guardian of all life itself. Of all life. She is the protector and guardian of life. So there was a homily I gave not too long ago. So think about, think about this image. The church. This, is, this goes beyond just the people and a little more into the, the structure as well, right? Um, you think about what that church, what that image looks like. What do you have typically in the center of a church? You have the tabernacle. What's in the tabernacle? 
It's the bread of life. The church houses eternal life itself. The altar in a church brings Christ, brings God, divinity, manifest right there on that altar. Brings the Eucharist. It brings life. The church is life-giving. The church sustains the spiritual life of the people. The people sustain the existence of the church, even. The church becomes this protector, this guardian of life. Life is found in the deepest and most spiritual sense within the womb that is the church. And that is how you should look at a church, as a womb. You really should. I mean, think about what, what's the space called up there where the priest is in the sanctuary, that whole area. It's called the nave, in some sense, in some places. Nave, as in navel, as in womb. What's happening there? Life is coming from that place, from that altar. And you have this, this beautiful image of, for lack of better words, a birth, right? Again, don't look too much into that analogy. Okay, also heresy if you go too far with that. But it's this idea. You get what I'm saying, right? Life is being shown. Life is happening here. What happens at baptism? Especially at our parish, right? A lot of parishes, their baptismal font's not up there in that area. But we have it right there. So if you're at a baptism, what do you see? Right there in the sanctuary, right there in the, the nave, in the womb of the church, what are you witnessing? You're witnessing someone dying and being reborn. The church produces Life. The bride produces life. The deepest, most spiritual aspects of life in that spiritual sense is found within the church. And from, from all of this, okay, from, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. From all of this, Christ, his bride, comes two things. Those two things that cannot exist without the other. And those are those two vocations we've been talking about. So this is the, this, the Christ and his bride of the church becomes this foundational relationship for those two sacraments, those sacraments of vocation, right? And these sacraments cannot, cannot exist without the other. And they're the priesthood, of course, and marriage. So in one sense, you have me. I look good, don't I? <laughs> and you, priesthood and marriage. These sacraments cannot exist without each other. They are, for lack of better terms, what we refer to as sacraments for the other. There are seven sacraments. The first five are all what I joking, again, jokingly call the selfish sacraments. They're not selfish, but that's what I call them. Because they're all sacraments for me, me, me. You receive the Eucharist. The grace of the Eucharist is for you and you alone. Confession is to forgive your sins and your sins only. Anointing of the sick heals you and you only. Baptism is for you and you only, the one being baptized. The uh, confirmation is you coming into the church and you only. All five of those sacraments are for you and you alone. You receive the grace from those. This is different. You do not become a priest for yourself. You become a priest for your bride, the church, for the other, for the people. You do not get married for yourself. You get married, we have couples preparing for marriage here, which is why I'm, I'm pointing at them. <laughs> you get married for the other, for your spouse. Marriage and priesthood are never for oneself where they are not selfish sacraments. They're not selfish sacraments. You always do it for the good of the other person. Now, that being said, you also do it, marriage and priesthood, while they're not, they're not sacraments for oneself, they are also, at the same time, they are sacraments that are a path to your own holiness, though. You don't become a priest for, uh, for yourself, but for others. But if answered that, answering that call correctly... Becoming that priest is a journey to holiness for me, okay? It's a journey for me. Now, if I was called to walk this path and I got married instead, that's a whole other conversation, right? You, you mess everything up, and vice versa, okay? You answer your call to holiness. But the call that you answer 
is not just for your journey, but for those you encounter, for others, for your spouse, for the church, for the people, whatever the case may be. A journey to holiness, to that end that we saw, the, the, the uh, wedding feast of the Lamb, that journey to holiness is always about serving, humbling ourselves, and serving others all the way along the path. Last night, who was here last night? Last night was a perfect example. Father Ignatius' homily, beautiful, beautiful homily he gave. And he talked, last night, if you weren't here, last night was the appreciation dinner. We had like 400 people here. It was amazing. It was all the volunteers. And, and if you're here, thank you for everything. I thought last night went great. Um, it was his homily. He talked about how, how the priest is here to serve, right? To serve you. That we are not ordained for ourselves. And that's the same thing with, with a spouse, you get married for her or for him. It's humbling. It's a humbling self, uh, or excuse me, it's a humbling service to others in, the, in these two particular vocations. All right? They exist. These vocations exist and mirror each other. They mirror. These are literally two sides of the exact same coin, these vocations. You cannot have one without the other. It's impossible. It's impossible. Not least of all because you can't get married without the priest. You know? But that's, that's not why, though. You can't have one without the other. They can't exist without the other. And so when one of these fails, when one of these suffers, the other bears the brunt of it as well. That's how intimately and intrinsically linked these sacraments are. So a failure in family, in marriage, right, in family life, when divorce rate goes up, that's equal. That's the equivalent of a failure in vocations or a lack thereof. I'll give you an example, and I don't have the, um, I don't have the data points to, to give you, but um, everything I'm about to tell you is easy. You can fact check me later if you want. It's out there um, for as far as what I remember reading. Um, I, I assume this would be pretty easy to find. <clears throat> they did a study, I think it was one of those Pew studies, there's research Pew studies, and they were comparing the, the decrease in vocations of the priesthood, and they were putting it up against divorce rate. And it's very interesting what they found. The spike in divorce rates drastically going up, and the fall in priesthood, or the vocations rather, drastically going down, coincided in the 60s and 70s with the sexual revolution. In that time, all in that time, when contraception, abortion, divorce, all that stuff entered into the family life, right? Now I'm just going to brief over, this is not what this talks about, but these things affected family life. Divorce rates skyrocketed. At the same time, vocations fell. It used to be it used to be a seminary, a ordination class would be 30, 40 guys in an ordination class. It used to be that if you were an associate pastor like me, you could go your whole career and never once be considered to be a pastor because there's just too many people in line ahead of you. Now, in the Archdiocese of Atlanta, they move you around every two years because they need you, they need you somewhere quick. It could be where you'd be at a parish that only needed one priest and you're there with four other priests because they got nowhere to put them. Now, you're lucky to have an associate. Unless you're a, a big, huge place like this, you, you don't got one. Divorce rates at the same time, phew, over 50%. is what they say. Now, think about that. What was happening in that moment, at that time? Family life falls, vocations fall. These sacraments are intimately connected. Now, turn that around as well, because now they did not do a study on this, but I've always been curious, and this is, my, this is just Father Adam's speculation, okay, and I'd, I'd be curious the, the data points on this, but what if it was the other way around? Now, I'm sure what I just presented is, is a huge part of, of all of it, because these sacraments are intimately connected, but remember, what, ha what one does adversely or positively affects the other as well. So what else was happening in the 60s and 70s that we didn't know about till just recently. Yeah. 
So all that stuff that broke in Boston, the sex abuse scandal and all that, that wasn't stuff that was happening that week when they broke those stories. Those were all priests that were doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing a decade or more prior, right? Or not even a decade, but several decades prior. Back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, all these old guys that were now being accused of things they did ages ago, a generation ago. All at the same time of, I keep pointing to this like I had that up there, I don't. The sexual revolution, the 60s, 70s, that same time frame. So one might argue, well, well, maybe it wasn't the fallen family that led to a decrease in vocations. Maybe it was the failure of priests to live their vocations that led to the fallen family. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Think of it like this, though. Both of these, I'm sure that both of them, there's not a finger to blame on either side of that coin. You're not point, we're not pointing fingers. It's like if you're looking in a mirror and you saw yourself in the reflection, you reached out and you touched the mirror. Who touched who? Did you touch the mirror or did your reflection touch you? These things are happening simultaneously and they're affecting each other. They're affecting each other both to understand how these things bring us to holiness, we have to understand what they are, okay? We have to understand that these sacraments are intimately connected in ways that, that they cannot exist without the other. And there is no path to holiness without these two pillars standing strong. There's only two. And like I said, all those other paths, all those other calls to holiness... Uh, a single life, a consecrated life, etc. All these other things, they rest on these two things here. And if you knock one of these things out, the whole tower comes crumbling down. Both of these are needed for us to, to attain true holiness. You cannot attain holiness if I'm not doing my job. I cannot attain holiness if you are not doing your job, living your vocation as well. Priests can't do it without married couples. Married couples can't do it without priests. We feed off each other in the deepest spiritual of senses. So, that all being said, <laughs> I was worried tonight. I was telling Suzanne earlier, because uh, when I do these talks, I, I practice these things over and over again. I, I lay it all out. And I was worried because the first half of this talk, I could only get it to be like 30 minutes and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Uh, it's already 7.30, and we're not halfway done. So <laughs> I think we'll be fine. <laughs> um, but, this, but tonight, just so you know, tonight will be shorter than next week, though. So there is a natural stopping point. We're going to just talk about priesthood. We, we might get into to marriage, but uh, we're going to finish priesthood tonight for sure, and then marriage will be next week. But, um, so that being said, so understanding... Uh, the bride and the church, or the ch church, Christ and the bride and the church, understand these sacraments are for the other, understand they can't exist without each other, all of this. Uh, what I want to turn to now is I want to start talking about the priesthood specifically. So, to understand these calls to holiness, to understand that, that we're all called to that image, that first icon you saw, what I want to talk about now is the priesthood itself, okay? And then next week, like I said, we'll talk about marriage itself. So, Understanding the priesthood in a deeper call. What does it mean to be a priest? Where's he going? He, I, my future priest is not leaving, is he? <laughs> Water break, okay. Understand the priesthood. The first thing, the first thing you need to understand about the priesthood about me is that priests, that Father Adam is what we call in persona Christi, which I spelled wrong, capitus, and I also did not write that. In persona Christi capitus, which means, is Latin for, does anybody know? That's, yeah, it's not very hidden in there, is it? It's pretty easy to see. <laughs> in persona Christi Capitus. What's Capitus? Do you know what that means? Head, that's right. In the person of Christ, the head. What this means, <clears throat> the priest is in persona Christi Capitus. This means the priest acts as the person of Christ in the moments of those sanctifying graces that are found in the sacraments. So in other words, when the priest performs a sacrament, it is Christ himself we don't say working through the priest, but it is Christ himself as the priest, right? The priest becomes Christ in that moment, the moment, to administer that sacrament. Now, why do I say it like that? It is not Christ working through the priest, okay? That's the equivalent of, 
uh, let's say Suzanne's doing, um, oh, you're good. I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> let's, Suzanne's working in youth ministry or something one night, and I say, Suzanne, I need, you to, I need you to go down there, and I need you to run over this material with the kids, and then have them do this activity. And she's, okay, Father, absolutely. And she goes over there, and she does all that. What's she doing? She's doing my will, right? She's doing, doing what I told her to do. I'm working through her, right? But she's the one doing it. That's not what happens in sacraments. That's what's happening here right now. I hope that's what's happening here. I hope God's working through me. That's what happens during the homily. That's what happens during ministry. That's what happens in any other thing where God works through us and we do God's will. That is not what's happening in the sacrament itself. It is the priest as Christ himself performing the sacrament. That is why in confession, it is not Father Adam who forgives you. But yet it is Father Adam who says, I absolve you. That's why in baptism, it is not Father Adam who baptizes you, but it is why Father Adam says, I baptize you. A couple months back or a year or so ago, there was a priest. Um, I can't remember where he was from now. He, uh, and he, no malicious intent. He just made a boo-boo for 10, 20 years. He baptized. He, they found out he had baptized for a generation or more. He had been baptizing. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He got in so much trouble for that. A, a lifetime of baptisms that were invalid. And so they didn't, they didn't kick him out, they didn't lay aside him or anything, but he now spends the rest of his priesthood hunting down these people and rebaptizing them. That's what he does to atone for that mistake. And he wasn't trying to be mean, he wasn't trying to do anything malicious, he just thought it was a nice gesture. He just failed to realize the implication of what that means. Words matter. Okay? Words matter. And so... The priest, as in persona of Christi Capitus, becomes Christ in those moments. Now, it's just those moments. So when you see Father Adam in the gathering space, that's not the same thing, right? <laughs> you see Father Adam at a dinner or something like that, it's not the same thing, all right? It's only in the moment of, of the sacrament. So in the moment of absolution, in the moment of uh, the conferral of the Eucharist. So it's not even the whole Mass. It's just the Eucharist. It's just when the priest turns the body and blood into excuse me, turns the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus, okay? In persona Christi Capitus, only for the sacraments. Now, the priest also stands, as I said, in the person of Christ during the sacraments, but also strives to be, in all things, an imitation of Christ. The priest is an imitation of Christ in all things. Now, we are all called to be an imitation of Christ. Your calling to be an imitation of Christ and mine, to some extent, are the same. Mine goes a little bit further, though. Okay? So the priest's calling, right, we're all called to be imitations, but the priest is called to do so on a much, much deeper level. So to imitate Christ, as we all are, in both word and deed, the priest goes further with mindset, with gender, with role within the world, right? His place in society, his position as a bridegroom to the church to the bride, to Christ's bride. Every aspect of the man in priesthood is called to be an imitation of every divine, spiritual, biological, earthly, and heavenly sense of Christ himself. He is called to be an imitation of Christ in the fullest, because in those moments of the sacraments, he is. He is. Others are not quite as strict, right? Those who get married, obviously you are called to be an imitation of Christ as well. But there's a limit to that. Because you're married, right? Or because you're a woman. Or because you choose to live the consecrated life. Or whatever, whatever other path to holiness there is. So there's this limit to that call. Now, like I said, we're all called spiritually, absolutely. But that aspect goes even further to every sense. Christ being fully human and fully divine. And so in that fully human part, the priest is called to be that imitation in all aspects. The priesthood becomes this divine image. Or excuse me, I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase it. It becomes the image of a divine marital union with God. That's what the priesthood is. It's this earthly image of a marriage with God the marriage of the Lamb, that wedding feast of the Lamb. 
our call to holiness is seen in the reality of what the priesthood represents. And it represents this eternal life with God. The one that we're all called to. That very first image I showed you, that icon. That's that call to holiness. That's the divinity that we're called to. That's what priesthood represents in this world. This eternal life with God that we're all called to. It becomes an image of the wedding feast of the Lamb. The priest takes the role of the bridegroom to Christ's church here on earth, as I just said. And because of that, because the priest takes that role of bridegroom, what does that mean for priest? It means the priest is not single. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Unavailable. <laughs> the, the priest is not single. He is married. If he is taking the role of all aspects of Christ, Christ is the bridegroom to his bride, then the priest also takes that role of bridegroom. And if the priest is the bridegroom, who is the priest's bride? Who's my sweetheart? Who's church? You all. <laughs> you all are my bride. Church, yes. The church. The priest is married to the church. The priest is married to the people. To Christ's bride. The church here on earth, right? The priest takes that role of bridegroom. The church here on earth represents and is Christ's true bride. So, if we have groom and bride, right? That's that relationship. So what is that invisible reality, the visible sign of the priesthood in the church? What does that look like? That, once again. This becomes, this image also becomes this image. That becomes that. Right? Heaven, earth. This is the visible sign of priest and church now. Or we are the visible sign of that. Okay? The priest and the church are a mirror image of Christ and his bride. So, just to refresh though. So you have Christ as bride the church, as we talked about. Okay? And then we had, from, from Christ, he gives himself fully, okay, to the church, completely to the church, and the church does what? The church is, uh, becomes incomplete without Jesus, okay? So it's that divine relationship, as we talked about. The same thing goes for the priest and the church. So the priest and the church are a mere image of that relationship. So the priest gives his whole life to the church. He devotes his everything to the people, to the bride of Christ. And what happens? The church, in response to that gift, sustains the life of the priest. The priest's mission becomes incomplete without the church. The church becomes incomplete without the priest. Think about that. Think about it. If you are the bride, you are church, if there were no Catholic priests at this parish, would you be here? No. No. You are only complete because I am here. If you were not here, if there were no Catholic parishioners here, would I be up here talking to myself? Probably, but... <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Of course not. If you weren't here, I wouldn't be here. I am not complete without you. Right? To get a little cheesy, you complete me. Right? Was that Jerry Maguire? Was that it, I think? The church sustains me, the life of the priest. The priest, the priest gives himself fully to the church. And once again, it becomes this total, complete gift of self to the other. And so my whole self being given to you, again, like Father Ignacio was talking last night, we are here to serve, to give ourselves unto you. Right? Just like Christ did on the cross. He literally poured himself out for his bride. That's what the priest is supposed to do. Am I perfect? No, I'm not. I'm not. I try. You know, I do the best I can. But none of us are perfect. Are you perfect? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The priest gives himself fully to the church. And the church gives herself fully to the priest. And you see that. Again, I, I keep going back to last night, but it was so perfectly timed. You saw that last night. There were 400 volunteers, ministers, people who work and help in the church. 
And so it's hard to sit back and not acknowledge or not understand or see how giving myself fully, this complete gift of self to church, the church sustaining me, the church giving herself completely to me, to God. You saw that last night. This is that relationship, right? In the world, the priest and the church, they stand in as those visible signs of Christ and his bride. They are a sign of our eternal calling, a sign of our eternal union with God. Now, I was wrong. That was 45 minutes exactly. <laughs> I thought it was going to go a lot longer. So I'm going to let you guys decide. It's about 746, 750 right now. Um, that is essentially what I want you to know about priesthood, okay, as far as this call to holiness. Okay, so I think what I've established is, is what the priest is, the relationship with, between priest and church, um, what that looks like, okay, and how that kind of mirrors and reflects that image of, the, um, of that image there, how it mirrors and reflects this, this icon, this call to holiness, this union with God, okay, at the, the, eternal, the eternal union. Now, that's what I'm trying to convey. That's, that's the gist of tonight. You have a choice. We're in now. It's about 45 minutes. We've been here about 45 minutes or so, uh, a little over. We can end now because this is a natural stopping point, or we could push on for just a little bit and start marriage. But if we do that, we're literally going to end in like the middle of a random slide. Okay? So if you don't want to do that, you want to kind of self-contain it because next week's going to be all about marriage and all these slides kind of build on each other, and I'm not going to have time to do a huge recap. <laughs> So would you guys rather just take, take five minutes, we'll do a little Q&A, because we got extra time for that. We can do a little Q&A on priesthood, and then next week we can just devote it totally to marriage and uh, consecrated life, single life, and all that. Was that kind of, would you, rather, would you rather break it right here? Okay, that's what we'll do. All right, so you guys take about five minutes, uh, small group discussion about, um, I don't know, priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> Take about five minutes, five minute break, and we'll come back together and we'll uh, do some Q&A. All right, let's, do, uh, let's start getting back to our tables. Let's, uh, it is 7.55. Let's, uh, let's bring it back together. Oh, we got some people with microphones, I believe. Yeah, Mark and Suzanne. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, criticisms. You can take out that door. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. Oh, we're not. Go ahead, right here. You next, okay. <clears throat> This is not the way I think, but a lot of people say that priests should get married and have children to stop the sexual abuse. And oh. I don't believe that, but I just want you to... You may comment it. on that? Yes, please. <clears throat> priests should get married because it will help stop the sexual abuse of children. <clears throat> no, that is a fallacy argument in and of itself. Um, most, so I think the last time I saw the numbers, I think it was like 2 or 3%, which is 2 or 3% too many. One is too many of all priests globally um, have committed any of those types of crimes. Um, do you look at other stats, and it's family members, married men and women, who, who teachers, Boy Scouts, counselors. That's just because a priest can get married, it's not going to stop that. You know, you look at all the, the, the people who can get married, or all the people who are married who do that, and if that was, if there was any sense of truth to that, just from a, a logic standpoint, it's that's just not the case. Logically speaking, that's just not not what we see. Now that being said, um, as far as the the reason for priests being allowed to get married, that's just there's a fallacy in the logic. Um, the reasons priests should not get married, though. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to see more. So as you ask these questions, my guess is there are a lot of these are going to be answered next week. Um, you're going to see next week, especially towards the end, after marriage, we're going to come back to priesthood as well. And you're going to see uh, 
in detail the reason why priests should not get married and the danger that that would cause if they do. So I'm not, I don't want to spoil too much for next week, um, but yeah. So that, come, make sure you come next week because we are going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay, yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Who? What are we doing? Me? Yeah, go ahead. You got the mic. Father, <clears throat> we heard when you came about your life story, but we wanted to know in our table how you became a priest, the calling. How I became a priest? Yeah, like, there was there a call? Like, Pope Francis was passing a, a church. He was going to get engaged that night, and then the church stopped him because he saw the church, and he went in instead. So how how wait, wait, so what, I didn't understand that last part you said what <clears throat> how how I want to be a, how I became a priest what was your call how did you discover that <clears throat> how did I discover that, that I was you called wanted, to be a priest that was your yes like the very first time yes. I was actually just telling uh, Jude over here when I was about six years old I said I wanted to be a priest and about five or six years old and not understanding what any of that meant at that age uh, somebody asked me my mom asked me she goes well, why do you want to be a priest I said, oh, because priests are clearly the holiest and closest to God there is. Uh, and so when I was little, little, I used to think like that. Uh, I've come to think differently. <laughs> but, uh, but that was that, that, original, that original just instilling within me the sense that, that there was something special. There's something different. There's a, a call, it was a call to holiness, essentially, you know, and um, that was to be lived out vocationally in, in that way, the priesthood. Um, I will tell you, though, in a more practical sense, um, I, I got to high school and had a girlfriend, and priesthood was the last thing on my mind, I can promise you that. Uh, I ended up not going to seminary right out of high school. I think this is all online, too. But there's like an hour-long vocation story I gave at some point that I think is online or something. You can Google me. It's on YouTube or something at a different parish. I think they filmed me saying all this. But the short version is that... Um, I went to the military, of course, I think you guys know that, and then when I got out of the service, uh, that just that feeling, there was just this general feeling um, of, of, you know, I used to want to be a priest, and it just kind of nagging at me, and so I was going to go to school anyway, because I didn't go to college at, right out of high school, and so I said, well, since I have to go to college anyway, i got to go to school for something, let me just go, and let me check out seminary. I'm not, I didn't go to seminary to become a priest. I went to seminary to help discern whether or not I was called to priesthood. And the first year in seminary, I decided I was not called to priesthood, and this is not for me. Uh, it was a nightmare. Um, and, yeah, I, I had made the decision very early um, in that call at, at the seminary my first year, because I was six years in the military, and then I had to go to seminary, I had to do college seminary. And so I was in class in school and in this dorm with a bunch of kids right out of high school. It was, it was just, it was terrible. It was horrible. When I got there, uh, at that time, they still had enough vocations where everybody had to have a roommate. And when they asked me how old I was, they were like, oh, yeah, you, you don't get a roommate. Never mind. Uh, so I was the only one in seminary for at least, at least the first year that had his own room because I was so much older than all the other kids. Um, so I had made the decision to leave the seminary uh, that, that first semester. And then the rector came down and he said, hey, listen, we got a generous donation and we are, there's some lady, some family who has donated a massive amount of money to the school with the purpose of wanting to send all the seminarians on a pilgrimage in France. So we're taking all of you for free, all paid to France for spring break, which was after the semester. And so I said, well, I owe it to the people of God to stick it out for one year. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So I did, I did, I, and I will not lie, I only came back that second semester because I wanted to go on that free trip to France, but I was smart about it, I told God, I said, listen, I'm gone after this, and I was very honest in my prayer life, I said, I'm leaving, you know, I'm, I'm leaving after this, I'm only coming back to go this, so if I'm supposed to be a priest, you need to let me have some sort of aha moment in France, because after that, I got no else, other reason to stay, I'm, I'm out the door. And so we got to France, and at the time I had developed this devotion to a uh, very obscure saint, St. Philomena, um, and I always call her my little sister. Um, she was a 12-year-old saint who was martyred, and, and she's, that's a whole other story. But um, when we get to France, she, she is, uh, she had, John Vianney, St. John Vianney, patron saint, parish priest, had a devotion to her as well. Uh, but I didn't really know how strong it was until I got to France. We walk into John Vianney's basilica, where his body is, and above the altar is this huge mural. 
and uh, or mosaic. It's like a, a passion and death. And everybody's looking at it. Like, what is that? Who, whose passion and death is that? And, and nobody could figure it out. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the story in life of St. Philomena. And uh, it was just, bam, right there. So that's pretty cool. We go to the next church, and I'm sitting there praying, and somebody uh, had thrown some trash on the ground, like in the pew, and I was like, well, okay, I'll pick that up and throw it away on my way out. I pick it up, and it was a crumpled up holy card of St. Philomena. We go to the next church, and it, I walk around the corner, and there's this whole little devotional alcove with kneelers all facing this giant statue of St. Philomena. And she was everywhere we went. And I think the straw that broke the, the back was uh, we went to La Salette, France. So I attribute my, my vocation, uh, my aha moment was in La Salette, France. There's a monastery in La Salette, the, the Brothers La Salette, where it's literally on the top of this French, uh, the Alps. It's in the top of the Alps in France, and it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's this amazing place, and it's the only thing to see there. The only reason you go to La Salette is to see that monastery. There's nothing else there. And so we get there, and it's just spring break, so it's still snow on the ground and everything, so a lot of it's closed off. We take the tour. We still do all the pilgrimage stuff, the sightseeing things. We get out, and I see this hill. So the monastery is literally at the peak of this mountain, and there's another peak that's just maybe... I don't know, 100 yards up. It's not that steep, but it's blocked off and covered in snow. And I thought to myself, man, I'd really like to stand at the highest point and look down on the monastery. And there's this big tape that says something in French that I assume says, don't cross this line. <laughs> but I don't speak French, so <laughs> I didn't know what it said. And I thought to myself, listen, what are they going to do? They're not going to kick me out of the country. They can't send me home. I don't plan on going back to seminary anyway. I'm going to jump over this gate. I'm going to climb up to the top of that hill, and I'm going to see what I want to see. And so I did. And I hike up this little hill, and uh, about two-thirds of the way up, I hear somebody yelling. I'm pretty sure they were telling me to come back, but I, what, what? I can't hear you. And uh, I get to the top, and uh, I saw two things. One, I think this is why they were upset. I saw a bunch of other seminarians thought they could do the same. They were following my lead. <laughs> they weren't happy about that. But as I looked down, I saw two. So La Salette was an uh, apparition site as well. So there's an apparition of, uh, there's a big statue of our Blessed Mother where the, where the apparition appeared and all that. But then off to the side was a larger than life statue that you couldn't see on the ground because of the snowbanks of St. Philomena. And as I looked down on St. Philomena, I don't, I don't know what happened, but I just had this this overwhelming sense of peace that I had never felt before in my life. Um, and it was just this calmness and this idea of becoming a priest, this idea of not becoming a priest started to scare me. And it was just, that was the moment. I don't know how to explain it any more than that, but it was just, it felt like, it felt like grace through the intervention of St. Philomena. And I attribute a lot of my priesthood to, to her, you know, to being here. So does that answer your question more or less? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. About the talk, maybe? <laughs> about anything. You can ask. I'm just kidding. You can ask about anything, but go ahead. Uh, I've been watching Father, um, Father Mike Schmidt's um, series on the catechism. Yeah. And what he was saying this morning was very much in line with what you were saying about the relationship of the Holy Trinity. Oh, thank goodness, because I wasn't listening to him. <laughs> that made me nervous. So no he worries. Is, he is You're smarter good. than me. <laughs> But he also mentioned uh, Bishop Callistos Ware, the um, Orthodox bishop. Okay. Because he was talking about the filioque controversy. And he said that Bishop Ware had said that he did not feel that this division was insurmountable um, between the East and the West. And one of the thoughts I had when you were talking about the priesthood, though, was their priests don't get married. I mean, their priests do get married. And I'm wondering why their priests get married and ours don't. So, okay, married priests. So their priests, that's, the way you worded that's misleading. So remember, words matter. Their priests do not get married. No priest has ever gotten married. Okay, that's not what happens. Their married men can become priests. Huge, huge difference. Okay. A priest cannot get married, but a married man in the Orthodox Church can become a priest. All right? So they can do that uh, for whatever. I, I'm not Orthodox. I don't know their theology. I don't, I don't know all the, the nuances of that. I know that that's how it is. I also know that in, even in the Orthodox Church, though, so the fullness of the presbyterate is only attained through celibate men. 
So even though some married men may be called to priesthood in the Orthodox Church, they may get married, they will never be bishop, and they will never attain the fullness of priesthood. So, the, well, let me, again, let me be careful how I word that. The, the fullness of holy orders. They have the fullness of priesthood, but holy orders. So there's three levels to holy orders. There's the diaconate, the presbyterate, and the episcopacy, the bishop. Okay? So the bishop is the fullness of holy orders. They're, it's all the fullness of priesthood. They're all priests. Well, the deacon's not, but they're, you know, it's priesthood in that sense. Um, it's just, yeah, that's, that's what they do. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't grow up like that. I didn't study that. So I, I'm not, I can't go very deep into that. Uh, I do agree that there's nothing between the two of us that is insurmountable, um, that East and West is... I, I, they are destined. So they are two, as J, JP2 says, St. John Paul II, they are two lungs in the same body. Um, but I think even, like I said, analogies break down when you talk about God. And no analogy is perfect when you're talking about a perfect being. So even though they are, they are two lungs in the same church, the same bride, the same body, it is also, they are destined for this right here, for union. Um, and so I agree that there's nothing insurmountable However, I doubt our lifetime will see that that union. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I can't I can't speak a lot to that. I'm just not I'm not as versed in Orthodox theology. I'm sorry. Yes, you and then you. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that you said is when you were talking about the priest um, during the actual sacraments, like during the consecration of the host or when mm -hmm. you're baptizing a child, you. It's not Christ working through you. You are Christ, basically, mm -hmm. at that moment. But anybody can baptize a child or can do. So how, how does that? So, yes. No, so, yes and no. Not anybody can baptize a child. Um, that comes with conditions. So there's conditional uh, elements to that. So when what you're talking about is an emergency life or death situation only. So let's say you're a, you're a nurse, you're a mom, your, your baby is born, and um, it's just, yeah, they, they're going to die. The priest is, is just not going to get there in time. You can baptize that child, right, under the condition that this child is definitely going to die. I'm a nurse, right. Okay, so you can baptize under the condition that this kid is going to die. If this kid, if that child does not die, that baptism did not count. No. That child has to be baptized. So that is, that is the, it's a conditional baptism in that sense. And so the, that child, if that child lived, they have to go be baptized properly. Um, and so you have to remember, while, while we are bound by rules, God is not. God, God is greater than the rules that we have for ourselves. Um, so in that sense. So, so yes, in situations, certain extenuating circumstances, you can baptize, but that is more of a, a pastoral uh, grace than it is a uh, theological hard rule. You know what I mean? Um, so it's not the same as saying that you're a priest in that moment, but it's the same as saying that through in that moment you're able to baptize. So what I didn't talk about tonight was your baptismal calling as priest, prophet, and king. Okay, so every one of you, men and women, are called to priesthood by your baptismal calling. It's not the same type of priesthood as I am called to, obviously. It's a different type. But in that sense, you are called to, or you're able, you have the ability in those circumstances to baptize. So, for example, anyone who's baptized a Christian in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water, the church recognizes Okay, so for example, not just these circumstances, but if, if somebody's getting married and they come from a Baptist church or a Methodist church and that's how they were baptized, we recognize that as a valid. Okay, because through that baptismal calling, your baptismal priesthood, you all have that ability. That does not mean that you can go do it, though, <laughs> as a Catholic, uh, but except in those extreme circumstances. Now, the reasons that others are allowed to do that is, you know, there's other denominations. They're not, they're not Catholic. They're not held by the same, the same rules we are as God. Uh, so hold on. So I promised her. Is that answer your question, more or less? Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah, uh, in the blue shirt right here? I'm sorry. And then uh, back here in the hoodie. The, yeah. Well, yeah. You, touched, you just touched on what I was going to comment about. I, um, when I was going through confirmation and stuff, and the priest asked me about my baptism, uh, baptism um, I was baptized 
in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and mm-hmm. water flowed over me, mm-hmm. dunked. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was recognized. And yeah. like you said, you yeah. know, not to be confused with the priest that said we. I have no idea what the pastor said, but I know so, the name yeah. he did baptize me. Do you remember what church you're baptized in? Yeah, a Baptist church. Yeah, he said I. I. 13. Yeah. And they say I or we. Yep. I have no idea. But I did know, yeah, through Good. the Trinity I was baptized. Absolutely. Jess. This is just a fun question. Um, I Because I know we're baptized, priest, prophet, king. For fun, I like to say priestess, prophetess, queen, as a woman. However, <laughs> however, I know that it's Jesus within us and that God's always looking for Jesus within us and the unity with Jesus. So it would technically be incorrect to say priestess, prophetess, queen, correct? You would say... It would be... Uh, it would... It would be actually priest. heresy, but yeah. yes, that's what I was thinking. Heresy, yeah, yeah I'll yeah, still no. probably do it, but it's fine. So that'll. So this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I did tell people it's heresy after. So yeah. So this. Uh, so just to comment very briefly, uh, I, I won't go too far into to that because some of that's going to be revealed next week as well. Uh, the priest is prophet is king. You're going to see next week when, when this. I hope. My hope. My goal is that when this these two nights are over you're going to come to see a greater picture of the role of priest, of church, of bride, of groom, of men, of women. And it's, going to, it's just going to all connect. So right now, sometimes I feel like the world is viewing those, those roles and those positions and those, those people um, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And it's, they have all the pieces, and they just don't have them in the right spot. It's just, it doesn't make sense. When you, when you sort it all out and you see the picture... I hope th- these these images and these things just start to click, and that'll. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to go too much into it because that's what we're going to talk about next week as well, towards the end. Um, I, I'm hoping, my hope, if I'm successful, then that stuff will click, and you'll understand why it's important that uh, it's priest, prophet, king. Why it's important that that the 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 male is is the the priest. Why it's important that only men and women can marry. Why it's important that, that all these roles are the way they are. You'll, you, hopefully, you'll see that next week. Father Adam, can you clear this up for us? I for, doubt for it, me. but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, I know that we're supposed to fast an hour before receiving the Eucharist. Yeah. Are we still supposed to? And if we are, then are we also supposed to fast an hour after receiving the Eucharist? And why or why not? Are, are, are we supposed to fast an hour after? Why or why not? Like, are we still supposed to fast an hour before? And it, does that also mean that we should fast an hour after receiving the Eucharist? Um, I've never heard. I don't think there's any mandated or anything. I've never heard anything about fasting an hour after. Um, so I'm going to say no to that unless there's something out there that I'm unaware of. Um, my, my gut reaction would be no because you've received and you're now in a state of celebration. So it's kind of like in, during Lent when you're allowed to break your fast on Sunday because it's a celebratory. It's, it's, a, it's like a mini Easter. And so there's no reason to, to fast. Like Jesus says to the Pharisees when they're walking around picking grain, not fasting on the Sabbath. And he says, why do your disciples get, don't have to fast and everybody else does? What's he say? You don't fast when you're with the bridegroom, right? When you're at the party, you're not fasting. So after you receive communion and you're with the bridegroom, there's no reason to fast after so the fast before, though, you should be fasting before Mass um, or an hour before you receive the Eucharist, um, and that's in preparation to prepare yourself. You got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Down here. Mark, right here. Gloria, right here. Yep. Um, so I was just curious when um, the priest acts in the person of Christ in confession, Mm-hmm. Um, is it just in the moment of absolution or is it the whole confession? Like when you receive advice from the priest and yeah. the whole part. So it, yes and no. <laughs> so it, it is, it's the moment of absolution. So it's the moment the priest is acting in the person of Christ in the moment of um, the sacrament. So a sacrament has to have two things. The sacrament is the form and the matter. 
So when, once those two things are present and those two things are happening, that's the moment where the priest is acting in the person of Christ. So for confession, the form and matter is the penitent being remorseful, being contrite, and that's the, the matter, you. And then the form of the sacrament is the words of absolution. So those two things together. So if you want to get technical, I don't have to say anything to you. I could just say, here's your penance, say an act of contrition, here's your absolution. You don't have to give spiritual advice. You don't have to talk or anything like that. Um, a lot of priests do. If you've ever gone to me, sometimes I'll, I'll talk. It depends on how long that line is. But uh, I, I might give a little bit of advice and then give you absolution or something. Um, but it's... I, I would be hesitant to say it's the whole, the whole thing. But I'm very confident to say that it is in the moment of the sacrament itself. So a, a more clear example would be the Mass. So you're not, the moment of the sacrament is only from the, the moment of consecration, the Eucharistic prayer, all the way through it. There's not a single moment, so it's the entirety of the Eucharistic prayer when that's happening. Um, but it's like, it's not the homily. Right? Otherwise, homily would be the gospel. It would be gospel truth, and it's not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. More or absolutely. less? Or make yep. it more confusing? Yeah. Somebody else? Anybody else? Is that it? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> all righty. Well, let's, uh, if that's it, if that's all we got, then we will start to wrap things up. It's 820, 18. That's not too bad. Um, like I said, next week we'll, uh, we'll jump right into marriage. Um, next week we'll be, uh, it's going to be a little longer next week, all right? So get comfy, get ready to, to come, and we'll definitely spend the whole time uh, next week doing all this for sure. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions, then let us end with prayer, all right? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had to come together. We ask that you keep us all safe. We ask that you bring us back next week. We ask all of this in Christ's name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You guys go in peace.